have, uh, we have with us someone who has been involved in digital learning innovation for more than 20 years. Please welcome the University of Western Australia's Pro Vice Chancellor of Education Innovation, Jilly Salmon. So I'm going to talk to you about the impossible. So if you're easily scared, you can leave now or at any time. That's okay with me. And so I come from the very young country of Australia. Most of you know I'm not Australian, but I've been there nearly five years now. <clears throat> Probably another 20 and they will accept me. Um, <clears throat> but in the young country of Australia, a university that's 100 years old is very, very, very old. So, and uh, the University of Western Australia is very, very old. It's a research intensive, one of the most gorgeous campuses in the world, on the mouth of the Swan River in Western Australia. And I'm going to show you a one minute movie to get a glimpse of our environment and also our dreams. So, you need to watch very carefully because I'm going to talk about the brief glimpse you get of the buildings because that's where my centre is, the Centre for Education Futures. So, we will uh, move to the movie, please. stop moving forward, the world stops with us. So chase your dream. It's only impossible until it's done. Thank you. We made that movie to try and inspire our students but we actually found it inspires us even more. So, right at the beginning, you saw some what for University of Western Australia are true heritage buildings. And I, in there, we've put a futures observatory and a learning design studio to try and inspire the impossible in both our faculty members and ultimately our students through new design. So I've got this weird job title, Pro Vice Chancellor Education Innovation. I'm sure when I was appointed just over 12 months ago, nobody knew what that meant. Fortunately, they did allow me to invent it. Uh, while you're listening to me, just to say there's gonna be a bit of a poll at the end. Um, if you've got the uh, My OEB app, you can look it up. If not, um, there is a website there, so I'll leave that up so that you can take part in the poll in a bit. Now, I actually think an incredible number of words have been written about innovation, um, especially in the scope of educational innovation and disruptive technology. And I did a bit of a survey um, it, I wasn't as knowledgeable as some of those people that you've just heard speaking. Um, but it was rather odd that probably one of the very top things that you can see was how to promote innovation in the changing modes of teaching, which I think is probably one of our biggest challenges of all. Um, and actually creating an evidence base for that because you all know in universities 
That's the way it goes. If you haven't got evidence for it, it doesn't exist. Um, and so we did a bit of a survey. There were the top universities. We did some visits as well in the US as well as other parts in the world. And everyone, just everyone, has still really not got into achieving true innovation. And so for me, that's still a bit of a mystery. And I think it's really rather extraordinary that everyone in, every, in education, all of you, at every level is trying to do this and yet most organizations, most institutions are still striving to reorientate themselves to an innovation culture. What will distinguish them? What will differentiate them? What they offer their students and stakeholders? So we could very, very easily blame it on the level of dogmatic approaches and resistance. And yet, by the nature, don't you think that most staff working in education are often the most open to change and development, would you agree? So I find it really quite a conundrum to tackle this. So maybe... You heard the first keynote this morning, David Price. Maybe we're in denial um, that we even need to change, possibly. That's one answer. So some of my answers. I know the university sector best, so I'll talk about that. But I do actually think that this may apply to many of the other sectors represented in this room. The higher education sector across the world is very compressed but also highly competitive now, but also marginally differentiated. It's mainly differentiated by sort of research profile, research orientation, league tables, represent, uh, reputation. And also, everyone's operating in an increasingly less and less and less regulated world. Those of you standing, there's a few white pods that you can sit on down the front here, I've noticed. If you're not too frightened. Um, now, governments around the world are pressing for larger proportions of their populations to attend university. Most of them, not here in Germany, I understand, but most others, have made pain for the experience, a lifelong one for most students. And even that has done little to dampen the enthusiasm for higher education. There's more people going to university than really ever has in our lifetime. Our children and our grandchildren are going to go forward and forward and forward. So there does appear to be, using the entrepreneur's words, reliable growth in the marketplace. So therefore, we need to innovate. We need to find ways of reaching that growth. Second, of course we know, and it's just been mentioned in the session just now, that the number of university campuses would have to increase at an incredible, alarming rate. I've heard something like one per month for the next 10 years in order to meet the requirements of teaching in traditional ways. And clearly that's not going to happen. It's also not practical to extend the existing campuses that we have um, with physical capacity and real estate. So therefore, innovation, again, is needed. Um, third, we know much of the way that we are teaching in universities at the moment will not provide the citizens of the future with the right skills nor will they graduate with the ability to undertake multiple careers during their lifetimes. We've also heard most babies being born today will live to over 100. I mean, we really need to be educating those people, don't we? Not ourselves. So in short, the nature of work is changing. So whatever our educational purpose is, the need for change is striking. And every single one of us has a huge responsibility 
as educators to innovate to meet these and the many other challenges that we face. So, why would we turn to technology to assist us in this conundrum is one of my questions. Well, one of the things I've done since I've been at the University of Western Australia, and as I mentioned, we put a physical space. It's kind of a cross between a, a space for the community to gather, a bit of a maker space too, somewhere a bit different a bit different from the traditional areas and it's actually for staff not for students. Most universities in the world are changing their libraries and many of their traditional buildings into informal spaces for students so we thought we might do that for staff too and we called it the Futures Observatory. So why put some technology in it? Well many forces of course in our society can bring about large-scale changes in economics and societies but since the industrial revolution say the late 18th and early 19th centuries technology has had this unique role in powering growth and transforming economic value it has to be technology technology represents in itself new ways of doing things and once mastered creates lasting change which applied to universities and schools and training of all kind we won't immediately unlearn you know our teachers and ways of teaching our campuses physical and virtual Finally, through technologies, the ideas become implanted as innovations and our worlds start to move faster. We can make it faster. So, the most interesting part of this for me is that some technologies have the potential to disrupt the status quo in education and we've just been talking about some of them and lead finally to true innovation in the service of learning and alter the way we imagine our teaching, teach our students, choose our curriculum, assess their ability, instill new cultures in them so they live and work differently in the future, in practice create entirely new products and services and others simply do not. And for me, things like lecture capture simply does not because it reproduces the ways we've undertaken learning for centuries. So I think we need to be very careful in what technologies we choose to disrupt and drive our innovations. Otherwise, we simply embed the old better than we did before. And the other thing to say is that education leaders cannot wait until the meager, the meager evolution that I've seen in my 20 years in this field catch up somehow. And we're not going to do it with learning management systems. And we're really not. You know, they're simply not moving. I've just chosen a new learning management system for the University of Western Australia. I got the best I could. But the original values of the way people teach and learn are still in there. And we need to change that. We need to move forward on that. Um, and, and we also cannot be held back by other industries on which we depend. You know, so the patch defense going on, for example, with publishers. We cannot let that happen. We do need to change this. So it's time referring back to this morning, to stop being 12 white men sitting around a table, to stop rearranging the furniture and actually move on with the world. And if we don't do it, no one else is going to. It's those of you who are here with me today that's actually going to do that run that you saw my student do earlier. So, 
At the moment, the link definitely between hype and potential is very unclear. And of course, there are still surprises to come. The future is like that. The future is like that. Nobody can be certain. We need now to understand how we can experiment, how we can take risks, how we can pilot, how we can prototype in practice to learn from the future as it emerges, be ready to respond. In short, create much more radical innovation and stop taking baby steps. It's time to shift. Um, this is uh, the Futures Observatory objectives. That you saw are in those rather nice buildings that look a bit like Stanford at the beginning, but flow by the river. Um, and we are reaching out to the impossible. So I'm trying all sorts of different ways to try and reach out to achieve the impossible. We're looking to partner with those who say yes rather than shake their heads in sorrow. We're seeing the observatory for staff as a location used for observing terrestrial and celestial events. Historically, of course, observatories were as simple as containing an astronomical sextant for measuring the distance between stars, or perhaps something like Stonehenge, which has some alignments on the astronomical phenomenon. Now, the way we're seeing this is we're trying to observe the future. And I guess some of the celestial events will be some of the digital life and educational purposes. So it's a metaphor, okay, but we're trying to push people to understand how a technology might help you to imagine an action, a future. So this is what we're doing in here. And we've got some technologies in there. I mean, this, you can see the uh, cruiser table that you can stand around. So it's focusing very much on collaboration, which a lot of our students tell us they actually want. Um, and of course, we're trying virtual reality. Everyone's in there playing around. Um, yeah, try some gamification. Bring it into the classroom, see how it works. None of this is costing us this much. It's all consumer technology that we can readily buy. Obviously, we're trying out the robotic stuff too. Um, and we've had quite a lot of fun with that, actually. I think someone mentioned earlier how much fun that is working with students and helping them to understand a bit about coding. So we've learned quite a lot ourselves. Um, um, and obviously the 3D printer and that sort of thing. So we're actually bringing it to the staff to enable them to play and to hope they can imagine the pedagogical purposes. And this is one of the key differences between consumer technology and stuff that's been produced for learning purposes. You invent the pedagogy, you identify the learning challenge, and then work out how the technology can support it not the other way around. So, do you get the idea? Um, you've got a bit of a vote of what of these technologies might actually help you. Did, does anyone want to go back to the URL at the beginning there? Or you should be able to find it on your My OEB. I've given you 10. Um, are we going back? Um, I've given you 10, robotics, 3D printing, internet of things, wearables, virtual reality, space exploration, predictive and cognitive analytics, mobile scanning, ultrasound, renewable energy, augmented reality. No opportunity with this particular software to add your own, so you're going to have to pick three, one vote each for those. And um, just to remind you, these are some of the things that you might like to look at. We're looking for fast development. We want something that if we found a pedagogical purpose for it, it would be easy to embed it. We want very wide and broad potential, and we definitely want to disrupt age-old educational models. So if you can't choose, use those three. So we'll give you a bit of time to vote.
and then we'll be able to get it up on the screen. Yeah? So all vote now. Okay. Can you see it? It's quite small. Can you see it at the back? Yeah. Okay, so the top one we're getting is virtual reality. Almost everyone voting for that. I think there's one, no votes for wearables. I'm surprised about that. Keep going, it'll keep coming. Um, renewable entry, augmented reality, analytics. Okay, I'll just leave it a few more minutes. Is everyone finished voting? Anyone still voting? Still shifting. I think this will stay on the app, so you can have a look later if you want. So it looks to... Oh, no, we're still moving. Somebody else has just got in. So it looks to me like Internet of Things, virtual reality and predictive and cognitive analytics are top with augmented reality, 3D printing coming soon after. Um, my challenge to you is to take some of the wackier ones like the space exploration and the mobile scanning and ultrasounds and see how they may affect your teaching because within the riskier ones is the greatest potential. So thank you very much for taking part. Have we any time for questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. So questions, challenges?